From April 19th to the 21st, the United Nations held its first special session on drugs since 1998. World leaders met to discuss, critique, and reform international drug treaties signed 18 years ago, when the UN actually called for the creation of a drug-free world by 2008. Unfortunately, other than some small changes in rhetoric, the convention has left international prohibitionist policies in full effect. The UN special session was called in 2014, when the leaders of Mexico, Colombia, and Guatemala, nations hit especially hard by drug cartel violence, pressed for a fresh review of international drug policies. During his speech at the convention, Mexican President Enrique Pena Nieto explained why the discussion was long overdue. In recent years, it has been clear that the terms of the debate have changed. A consensus is beginning to emerge in favor of a substantive reform of the current international drugs regime. The so-called drugs war, which began in the 70s, has not reduced production, it has not reduced trafficking, and nor has it reduced consumption of drugs throughout the world. Drugs trafficking continues to be one of the most lucrative activities of organized crime. Inevitably, the illegal trade in narcotics has led to death and violence, mainly in the producer and transit countries. My country is one of those nations that has paid a very high price a too high a price in terms of the loss of its internal peace, suffering and loss of human lives. We know more than most countries what are the limits and the painful implications of the paradigm that is mainly based on prohibition. According to the Mexican government, between 2007 and 2014, an estimated 164,000 people died as a result of drug cartel violence. On April 21st, Nieto offered legislation to help alleviate this crisis. But instead of more war, Nieto hopes to attack cartel profits. He announced plans to legalize medical cannabis in Mexico, while also decriminalizing up to 28 grams, or one ounce of the plant. We must move beyond prohibition to effective prevention and effective regulation. Thousands of lives depend on this. The General Assembly was also important for nations like Canada and Uruguay, as well as many U.S. states which have legalized or intend to legalize recreational cannabis in their jurisdictions, despite the policy being in violation of three UN treaties, a point that was further clarified by the International Narcotics Control Board on the first day of the convention. Conventions say that uh, the use of psychoactive substances, of narcotic drugs and psych psych psychotropic substances, has to be limited to medical and scientific purposes. This is a limitation which has been agreed upon by the, the authors mm -hmm. of the, the conventions, the state parties. The conventions provide for very strict regulations for opium cultivation, licensing and governmental control. And these uh, provisions apply mutatis mutandis to cannabis. So uh, that is where uh, the problem is arising because the governments are supposed to have a cannabis agency which gives out licenses, which monitors the collection of the, uh, the substance as well as controlling its distribution. So you, if, you, if you look at the uh, legalization or whatever is, which has been done in the U.S. states, uh, those are not being met fully. Each of the countries that are signatories, which are the vast majority of countries in the world and territories, um, if they made a decision outside the conventions, they would be in contravention. Um, the problem there is if you start contravening one international convention, then, well, what, what happens to the next one? So there is a, a need for consistency. So while medical cannabis, and even some forms of drug decriminalization, is allowed under current UN provisions, full-blown legalization is not. However, this left Canada's health minister undeterred when describing her nation's commitment to legalize cannabis next year. I am proud to stand up for a drug policy that is informed by solid scientific evidence and uses a lens of public health to maximize education and minimize harm. As a doctor who has worked both in Canada and in Sub-Saharan Africa, I have seen too many people suffer, suffer the devastating consequences of drugs, drug-related crime, 
and ill-conceived drug policy. While this plan challenges the status quo in many countries, we are convinced it is the best way to protect our youth while enhancing public safety. Canada will continue to modernize our approach to drug policy. Our work will embrace upstream prevention, compassionate treatment and harm reduction. We will work with law enforcement partners to encourage appropriate and proportionate criminal justice measures. We know it is impossible to arrest our way out of this problem. I acknowledge that other countries and cultures will pursue diff approaches that differ from Canada's. I believe that if we respect one another's perspectives and seek common ground, we can achieve our shared objective, protecting our citizens. Better yet, we can improve their lives. The UN meeting demonstrated the stark divide between member countries over drug policy. While some nations touted their progressive drug laws, others defended the use of executions for drug crimes. In fact, most of the convention's first day was dedicated to debating the death penalty for drugs, which is currently practiced in at least seven countries, including Indonesia, China, and Saudi Arabia. At one point, a member of the Indonesian delegation was booed when he called the death penalty an important component of the country's drug policy. The International Narcotics Control Board, as well as the majority of member nations, emphasize the need for a more humane response to drug crimes. Proportionality of sanctions is central to the drug treaties and must be central to a balanced approach. This unfortunately has not always been the case. Disproportionate responses undermine the aims of the conventions and the rule of law. It is good to note that more and more governments are reforming their approaches to criminal justice in this spirit. The INCB, which is responsible for promoting the application of the UN drug treaties, also pointed out that a criminal justice response to drugs is not required under international law. In fact, the convention's ambiguity leaves states to decide types of punishment, or lack thereof. We must recall, when discussing states' response to drug-related criminality, that not all these responses need to be rooted in punitive measures, nor must they even fall within the ambit of criminal justice at all. And we believe that harsh treatment programs, including those that involve the use of physical punishment, are not only inhumane but are not evidence-based and do not resolve the problems of drug dependence. On day two of the special sessions, roundtable discussions about synthetic drugs and heroin addiction were equally inconclusive. But even before the convention, it already appeared there was little chance the talks would have any real effect on the status quo. The so-called outcome document, drafted and negotiated in March, then adopted on the first day of the UN convention, hindered any real debate or international reform. The UN was accused of allowing repressive countries like Egypt and Russia to exert undue influence on the document's creation, resulting in the lack of a ban on the death penalty and no reference to harm reduction. Consequently, leaders of the Global Commission on Drug Policy, including Virgin Group founder Richard Branson, called the UN session a failure. Branson said the process was fatally flawed from the beginning and that it may already be too late to revive the international drug control system. The commission further urged that governments decriminalize all drugs. With its glaring limitations, as well as the diverse range of state drug policies, it was clear the UN special session wasn't going to create a more effective and consistent international drug framework. Instead, member nations used the convention to promote and justify their wide range of drug policies, and rationalize their fit with the vague UN treaties. Still, the INCB, which has no mechanism for enforcement beyond strongly worded letters, hopes that nations with successful drug reform policies will help others change their ways. And for that, there is perhaps no better example of a success story than Portugal, which decriminalized all drugs in 2001 and has been reaping the benefits ever since. The Portuguese approach on drugs has been considered a model of best practices. Due to the fact that we recognize drug use as an health issue. The criminalization creates a legal framework for implementing policies to reduce the harm caused by drug consumption and to refer drug users to the most suitable responses. Even if the drug users are not in a position to quit using drugs, they still deserve the investment from the state in order to improve their health and social condition. The implementation of evidence-based arm reduction measures is considered to be a key factor of our policy, 
as they protect not only drug users, but society as a whole. Such measures have proven its effectiveness and should be further promoted and implemented. Although international advancement on drugs appears stalled, and according to more progressive nations like Uruguay, the updated UN drug agreement is insufficient and flawed. Many countries are moving away from prohibition. Canada, Uruguay, and many US states have legalized or plan to legalize recreational cannabis. Others, like Jamaica, are decriminalizing the plant. Many more are legalizing the medical use of cannabis, including Australia. Furthermore, a number of these states and others have vowed to continue the fight for reform at the next UN Drugs meeting. Fortunately, they don't have to wait another 18 years for another international drugs debate. The next meeting is in 2019. Regrettably, people already suffering under oppressive drug policies don't have this privilege.